Well, boys, have I got a film for you this week. If you know anything about fishing, especially freshwater fishing, you're going to know that probably the most popular bait in the UK, maggots. Now, for those of you who don't know, the maggot is, I'm going to call it, the larva. For beginners, it's like the grub, if you like. It's the egg hatches out from a fly, a blue bottle going around, lays its eggs or something, rotten generally. The eggs hatch out, they turn into maggots. From there, they go to a stage of eating everything, and then they sort of pupate, I'm going to call it, into what's called a caster. Some people call it a chrysalis. And from there, it hatches into a fly, and the whole process starts all over again. But when we go into a tackle shop and just purchase, can I have a pint of maggots or a pint of casters? You don't realise that from delivery, from the um, actual maggot farm where they breed them commercially, to the tackle shop, you just get a little bait container, a small bait tin. There's a lot more work goes into it. So let's get over to Grant's tackle up and he's going to show you through what he does to give his anglers the best bait he can. So to learn a little bit more about the uh, the supply of bait that goes in your bait box when you come into a tackle shop, I'm here with Grant. You tackle up in fleet. Grant's going to give you a run through, give you sort of, of a guide, a potted history, or a potted history of maggots, Grant. Hi, Graham. How I are you? A, yeah, I, I want a potted history. He's preparing them now. Right, these are just yellow maggot. Yeah. Just normally bronze, but now yellow. Bronzing we don't tend to do. So. Now, how do they come into you? Let's say the bait. The bait man's just come. Am come. The Amazon man's just come. Yeah. He's got some cardboard boxes with maggots in <laughs> So generally, got fridges, what, yeah. what we do is that they all turn up, they come in a big pot like this to be fair, sealed up. That's, that's, your, deli that's your delivery That's my bucket. delivery pot. They will turn up in one of them yep. and then we tip them out into the trays and they absolutely stink. It's ammonia, I imagine, is it? Yes. So, <laughs> then what the process is, we've cleaned these ones already is basically we take the old sawdust out to remove the grease and the dirt and just the stuff that comes on your maggot because otherwise when you'd have it in your bait box yep. it would be absolutely stinking. Yeah. So um, the, the ideal way to do this is basically we run it down the shaker which I'll show you how to do it. Good job I wasn't leaning on that. It's got Parkinson. It's a nice fine special brush. out of the maggot into there which normally we would have bones feathers yep. a bit of everything and then the next process is it's literally we are removing all the grease off the maggots that comes with the fat that's on the chicken carcass the fish carcass that they feed all the maggots in the pit we put a riddle onto the tray and then we pour some onto the riddle which will then go through, which will take any dead maggot off, any loose, big like particles that won't go through this riddle, and that will sit away, which separates all the rubbish from your baits. So when you have nice clean maggots in your bait box, that's where it comes from. Now going back, while those are going through the uh, sieve, I'm going to call it, or the riddle, yep. back on the fridge, tell us you know, what sort of volume do you keep in there, temperature? Generally, temperature for the, my you know. fridge could be a bit bigger. Um, so generally I buy anything that's up to sort of 20 gallons a week which goes through quite a big process. More, more in June, I imagine. Was more it? in June, so yeah, as the weather improves. But the only other downside we do get these days is pellets. So yeah. due to pellets, we do less maggot sales, but maggot is still the popular bait for yeah. any fishing. And um, what, what temperature would you have on the fridge at? So temperature at the moment is run at sort of one degree. So, and the idea of that is it just to slow the bait down to stop the process of the maggot wanting to turn into a caster. Yeah which is obviously another process we can talk to you about. How long would you say when you get them from the farm at that temperature 
couple of weeks? Can you keep them for that? Or? At that temperature, like that, in an open container, yes, it's probably a couple of weeks, really? realistically. Because uh, what happens is your bait will shrink, your food spot, you'll lose it, it'll come out the end of the maggot, and then it's next thing it wants to turn into a fly. Now the fruit food spot's a little black dot in the pointy end for that the beginners, is. isn't so, it? So, next fly. Um, so they basically come into you as red, uh, come into you as white, or red, or yep. fluoro. Red, white, fluoro, yellow. Bronze. So we no don't do bronze now. anymore because yeah. of the bronzing agent they've changed. So That's we a just chrysidine, buy, was it chrysidine? That's it, chrysidine, which has obviously got its cancerous uh, yeah. elements to it. So now we just use a yellow dyed maggot with yeah. a different dye. Food dye or something? Uh, food dye can do it, yeah. yeah. That's what use a food dye in there. So if you look on here, you can see the little black food spot within the maggot. Yeah, it's the black dots that you can That's see it. go through them. And as the as the the maggot sort of gets older, this black food spot will work its way further and further down until it's in this pointy bit. Yeah. And then that's 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 almost the end of its life cycle. So then it will slow and go. It will, it will, it will go down, into a caster. It turn into a caster. Regardless of that temperature. Regardless of the temperature. You got gotcha. you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Generally, when I'm turning casters, I like to keep it in the fridge. Keep it wet, keep yeah. it in the fridge, and your maggots stay, your casters stay bigger, plumper, and they're not so small and pop when you hook them in. Now, when you riddle those off, let's say, for argument's sake, those reds, what do you put in them to stay? They're not going to sweat up because they're in no. the cold, aren't they? Yeah. What do you put so, in them If I'm storing maggot, I keep it in sawdust. Just plain sawdust? Plain sawdust. So, what I do is, so then obviously, what I do is I get sawdust. Um, I've ridden all the sawdust, I've taken out any sharp, bigger particles. Any particular wood, being so just nosy, hard because pine wood, wouldn't be good with it. Hardwood is better. This is a bit of a mixture. Yeah. It comes from a sawmills, I just filter it through. But then what I do keep back is some older sawdust. Once I've run my casters, and I've, I've done it all, I add a bit of older sawdust to you my You see the difference in the colour, can't you? Yeah, and that is basically what's come out of the maggot to take the you know, that's clean sawdust. Yes. And it will end up looking so it's gone, like that. It's gone from the white to the brown. White to a brown. So that's sort of soaked up. Everything out, Everything the, out in there. the maggots, yep. So, but what I use, I use that to put into my caster maggot and it helps it turn a little bit faster. Oh, really? Oh, I never knew that. Nothing to do with the flavour in there. <laughs> Not the <laughs> flavour. No, I would just say it's more to do with uh, breakdown times of other components in this if you've got other bits of fat and grease yeah. that's come off the maggot I think it helps make it want to turn so uh, you know it just contaminates the maggot and makes it want to do its process faster I've got I you yes yeah. so especially in hot weather it's got to be all down to timing timing and cold weather is even worse because you can't get them to turn so they will do it in time yeah but it will always happen like this weekend is winter league We've got 20 pints of casters to get out and they don't want to play ball. So hence the reason when you walk through the shop you will see three trays of caster maggot on the floor. So you've got your, let's say, white maggots, you've got them and you want to turn some for next week's fishing match. Yeah. How does it, what's the process there? How so do the you... The process then is, what I do is I'll pull the maggot out, I will give it some fresh sawdust, yeah. I will put a handful of old sawdust in there, which I can show you now. So I'll bring them out for a couple of days. I'll add a bit of older sawdust to this. Yeah which you can see the difference in the colour there. But what will happen is all of this sawdust will be all the dark brown by the time that's been through. So what we generally do is we keep back one maggot from the previous week because yes. it's easier older. to turn it, it's older, it's ready to go. If I had to force this to go, you'd have to heat it and it's just not as good. Yeah, it doesn't like it. Yeah. But what I'd do is if I show you a cast of maggot tray. Yes, sir. So I'll you see the difference. Yeah. So, and then I'll give you the process of it. So that's, that's our white maggots. Reds. Yellow. And we do, so this is a different size maggot. This is called a pinky. Yeah. This is a fluoro pinky, so a bright pink. As you can see, very well dyed. Yeah, and smaller. Smaller. Half the size of a normal maggot. Yeah, you don't get squats in for any we particular do, so reason. Uh, so squat fishing, generally canals, rivers, match fishing, fishing for bleak, small, small hook, fish, small hook, small fish. fish. Yeah. And this is what the squat maggot is. So when we get the squats in, we feed them. We get bread and milk. We dip the bread in the milk, and then put it in on the squat maggot, and they feed straight on it. It right, makes yeah. them a lot bigger, and they last for a lot longer then. But that's your squats. Are you these trade say. secrets that we should be putting on YouTube? Well, probably not. <laughs> oh. That's a squat maggot. So, so but a squat maggot, if you feed it, it doubles in size 
and it just looks so much better when you say it. But this is a red squat. Generally get white squat, two types, but at the moment red squat seems to be the seller. Do they ever use, I don't know this, uh, do they use those in a cast effectively or do they not no, turn? No, they do turn because as you keep squat, as you can see even within this, if you look very closely, you'll start, there is little skins and bits on the top and yeah. you do get it turned into caster, but I imagine trying to hook a, a squat caster yes, is going to yes. be an Find impossible my hook of, I'm not going to see the hook yes. size, it'd be a 20 or something. It would be very, it'd be smaller than that, it'd be a 24 or a 26. Yeah. I wasn't sure they still did those, you know, yeah. they're more of an old school canal type. It is, so, bait, and it? Yeah. this is for a canal winter league tomorrow. Oh, it is for that, yes. Or yes. well, the, the, the league's taking for, yeah, Saturday. And these well. people in this winter league, why are they not working? Uh, it's a Friday, they're all fishing. I've got my days wrong. It's Saturday. <laughs> Saturday. I'm on the wrong day, Brian. That's what it is. So, so this right. is your casters so as they go casters. to the customer. Yeah, as they go to the customer. So how I start my casters off, I turn them into, we have them in this tray, we keep them damp so they don't shrink too much. And as you say, if you look through the tray, you start, start to seeing, seeing that. they start slowing up and then you start seeing an odd Run cast swell a bit, starting, yeah. yeah. And then what we do is we pull them out, we warm them up a touch and then keep putting them away just to speed the process up. What would you do when you take them out of the free, uh, freezer, the fridge, fridge here, yeah. how long would you, you know, to the speed so up I'll, process? So I'll leave them out for a couple of hours, depending on yeah. how cold the day is really, yeah. hence the reason today they've ended up in the shop just oh, to get a bit yeah. of warm. Um, just to give them a chance to get the go, and then what I do is that cast, if you feel that ground, it's very damp, the sawdust. Oh, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah I'll be terrified they're going to get wet and creep out. They like don't. They do. If you get it too wet, they do, but they've got to be the right. Basically, the idea is pour the water into the sawdust and mix it in. Yes. If you spray it over and get the sides wet, that's You're when right. the maggot comes out. <laughs> and yes, so I have done it. Yes, it's, done it's happened, I imagine. So, what we do then is we put some onto the riddle. If you don't put too much, we've got to shake all the sawdust through. We... Right, so as they go through the riddle, what we have then is all the casters, as you can see, which was inside the, the caster maggot. Yeah, these ones, the hard ones. That's too. it. And then what we'll end up with, essentially, is this. So we've got dark light. and light, so if you leave them out in the in the air, they will all go completely dark and become floaters. Yep. So then what we do is with the fishing is we, we turn them off so there if you've got some light and dark, you've got a mixture of colours, you can see I've, I've turned lots of bait here. I mean, that's an odd bit left, but you can see the variation in the colours there. And then the idea is when the, the anglers get them, they can turn them to be a bit darker if they want yeah. them golden brown or dark colours and you open your, your casters up and pour them straight into water. Yes, that stops them, slows them. Slows them down, stops them turning into all dark floaters and you'd be fishing on the surface. Because in the summer, that's going to happen in a day, in a hot it, summer's day. It yeah. happen like that in a, yeah. a, 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 a 10 minutes in the heat, yeah, that'd be your casters You can gone. see all the different grades that's of gold it. there. How they're going darker there. Now those, when they're, they're chilled, Yep. How long in the fridge can those be stored? So generally what happens is you need to have a thick enough gauge bag, otherwise what happens is in a thin bag they get what we call bag burn, which is oh, little really? tiny marks on your casters. So if you're ever buying casters that have got little, you can't see it on like these. Like a sandwich bag, burnt, so it's yeah. too thin. So this, this actually should be a couple of gauges thicker really, but I'm using a, a thicker bag we can store them in and they get stored into a bucket generally. Okay, well, so if I show you we've done some vac pack sealed ones. Yeah. They're, the they're chilled, they're not frozen. They're chilled. They're chilled. chilled. Even so, even though they're chilled, yeah. you so can get burn on it. In a vat back like that, you won't get a burn because of the thickness of the bag, and I could probably keep them for a couple of weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. But obviously, as we all know, fresh bait is the key. So generally, the fresh casters that we turn in the shop are the ones that go out straight away, and they are fished with literally the same day normally when they're bought. And they're probably so the people know you buy a pint of magus. It's a pint. Physical. It's so casters are the caster. same sort of measurement? It's the same measurements, you buy a half pint, pint of caster. Um, as I say, they're not the cheapest ones, they're a bit more expensive. Well, than, it's labour intensive, it's more intensive. It is, so there's a lot of work goes into bait on maggot casters, looking after it every morning, riddling it to stop you guys having rubbish bait and having Dodgy skins bait. on the top and things like that. So yeah. there's always a process every day of the bait. So 
if people think we're a money earner or maggot, we're not. It's a it's a product for you guys to pick up in the shop that you to can't go fishing get with. To go, go fishing, fishing with. with. Yeah, exactly you can't go that. fish. Don't leave home without it. <laughs> As we know, if they get out and they get in your car. You are having blue bottles and everything in the summer not, for some time. Not, not just for a week, for quite a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Probably a couple of months, really. Yeah. They, I've found, so. and I've done it, of course I have knocked them over or spilt some, they get right in the berry, in the pile of the carpet, carpet and, you'll never get and then the wife gets in the car and there's 18 blue bottles on her lap. That's exactly that. It's exactly not good. That. Yeah, I think we've all been there as fishermen and in trouble. Yeah. So. I'll, I'll do you next. Yeah, go on. No worries. Uh, I'm just gonna just gonna fish for silvers. Hopefully, I'll snare one or two. And can I have a pint in total of bronze and fluoros, please? Pint. But then that's uh, years of experience, I suppose, been doing it for well, nearly 50 match years. Match fishing, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, enjoy your name. Yeah, enjoy your maggots. So customer's bait box, scoop, we go to the fridge and this is where I keep all my clean serving maggot that's already been prepared and whether it be a half pint, a pint. Obviously white maggots. And you can mix them, you can have you mix, can mix them. Red maggots or my special mix maggots oh. with a bit of all sorts. So red, yellow, pink. Yeah. And, and then also another thing we do use to stop the maggots sweating up, we give the customer a choice because some people are allergic to maize. Oh really? Which they don't realise. Is that the they gluten, want, whatever it is it or is something? It is indeed. So they I've end up getting that. their eyes streaming and stuff like that, which is <laughs> normally maize based. So maize, if they want maize, we just put, add a bit of powder to the maggot, purely to stop it sweating up. And we take it around the box and that will you won't have sweaty maggots anymore. If they don't want maize, what will be? Maize, the other alternative is we get the sawdust pot and we can give you, which is all sieved as well, so there's no big particles. And so if you don't like maize or you're allergic to maize. Yeah, but you're the tackle dealer awesome. and you're also a fisherman. So what's your favorite? My favorite is sawdust. Sawdust, yeah. But you will find match anglers prefer the maize. It softens the maggot and when they're fishing, hand to line and quickly grabbing a bait, you d the maggot doesn't roll off your hand, it stays soft in the maze and whereas obviously if you have it in sawdust the maggot stays harder and more rubbery. So that can go in the angler's fridge and depending you know what the weather system's like you keep it for a week, two weeks? Week, two weeks you're probably starting to turn into a few casters. Well, then but then you've still got still, bait? Still got bait, so if so it's in the fridge you can always go. Lid on with that? And lid on with that. And any tips on the lids? Having had well, the, in the, the tip on the lid is make sure every corner is <laughs> yeah. firmly clipped on the box. Yeah, because it only takes, so guys know, That's it. it just takes that in that, the tackle box or the back of the car. We'll and if that little, lid. So if your lid is tilted ever so slightly yeah. and your maggots were there, it That's doesn't right. take right. very long. And then you don't know that. Disappearing. <laughs> and you will only find out when you either find your bait box or two weeks later you'll have a load of flies. And in, in the comments page, has any other angler ever lost maggots in the car? That's going to fill the comments page yeah, up. Fill it all up, I imagine. I've heard a few stories and I've done a few myself as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, so, that's Grant, tackle up in fleet. If you want some decent bait, you can uh, 
Yeah, we'll get in touch with you. You've got a website, Yeah, it's a website, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, tackleupfleet.com. And it, um, you, can, you can order the bait in advance, you know? Um, yeah, so phone calls for ordering bait in advance, really. So casters, is normally important to get your orders in yeah. because obviously with the match anglers, they do get taken up quite quickly. So, yeah, and as they... you've seen, it's not a process. We just take them out of a bag and give them to you. We spend the time to actually turn a caster into a bait for you guys to fish. Brilliant. Thanks for that. I appreciate it, Grant. Thank you very much. And on behalf of all the beginners, hopefully they go fishing and at least try with maggots. Lovely. Well, that's some pretty interesting information, I think. Hopefully, a lot of beginners especially will know there's not just a maggot. There is a white, a yellow, a red, squats, pinkies, different types, different sizes, different species from different flies. And thereby, you should have any excuse for not catching a fish on them. In fact, I know about maggots because I've been to a maggot farm. It's in one of my books because these are out of print. But I did do a lot of book writing. I had 16 books published and this was one of them. Some of you guys out there will have it. And inside there, it's about my visit to the whole... I can smell it and almost taste it now. Maggot farm. I've got some pictures in here. I've got to try and zoom in with them, put them in there. They're my pictures. It's my book. It's my copyright, so I can use them. Um, it might be interesting for you. On top of what Grant said, some of the interesting facts. I've, I've got them down as bullet points. Let's run through these for you. Right, here's some of the facts I've got. And it's in my book. It's here. So you might pick them up in a second-hand bookstore. Some of you guys will have them. They're just called Graham Put a Guide to Freshwater Fishing Baits. It's basic, you know it's basic, you know it works, it's in there. Very, very little story. And listen, oh my God, I think it is, well, published in 1988. I wrote it in 1986, something like that. So I wrote it before a lot of the people that do stuff now for books and magazines, I probably weren't even born then. But anyhow, the info in there is all good stuff. Here's some stuff, I'm just gonna read through it. I might drop some pictures up here or here or just totally. Uh, when I'm talking about them, right? Went to a bait company in Somerset. Now they told me the flies blow. The blow is like the egg laying process, okay? To start the actual hatching out, as it were, the bulk that they want to get the most bait they can to get it to grass tackle up the shop. So these guys, big farm out in the Somerset countryside, that's where I went. The guy there told me the flies don't blow well in periods of low pressure. Also, the ammonia, which they secrete, produced from one concrete pit of, wait for this, one concrete pit holds 400 gallons of maggots that can travel over several fields. And they said the best time to, to grow and move the maggots on to get them in is a, the best blow period are times of high pressure. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've noticed between high and low pressure with fishing, they're up and down like a yo-yo. Sometimes I think I've got it just right. No, I haven't. But I used to think predators feed better in high pressure. Cyprinids, that's the one for the pharyngeal throat teeth, coarse fish to you guys, feed better in low pressure. What do I know? Okay, the red maggots, this was back then, it's probably changed now, was produced by the red dye scattered on the chicken carcasses in the fish farm, this is. So when the maggots eat the rotten chicken, they eat the dye as well. They told me then, years ago, it was the same dye as was used in sticks of Blackpool rock. I didn't know that myself till I read my own book. They say the maggots have to ingest that food, the dye, for the dye to take for about five days in these holding pits. Grant has 20 gallons of maggots, my God. In the peak first two months of the season, and in the UK that will be June and July when most anglers get out in good weather, the traditional season was back then, opens up. This maggot farm produced up to a thousand gallons of maggots a week. Plus they would turn, as you heard Grant talking about it, he turned those maggots into casters, 50 gallons of casters a week they could turn. In the height of the summer season, which is temperature controlled, as you can gather, if it's warmer weather, we even know there's more flies around, don't we? You notice it yourself. Not in the winters, in the summer, they're out there. Try leaving a ham sandwich out in the sun, 
you know, middle of July. Soon, bzzz, right in the height of the summer season, they can get through 16 tonnes of dead battery chickens, which is what the maggots eat. The fly egg laying process is improved dramatically when they're fed a blow, they lay their eggs on the, what they call the blow, on old pouting. That's a sea fish. Now, us sea fishermen know, because listen, I'm an all-round angler, done it all my life, so I know all about both species, freshwater and sea. But pouting goes off really quickly. So, if you're beach fishing or boat fishing and you want to keep pouting, get the guts out of them straight away and put them in the chiller or take your fillets off. They make very good fish pies and fish cakes out of pouting. But because they deteriorate quickly, I feel that's why the flies love laying their eggs on pouting because they want rotten feed for their young, their eggs to hatch out and get straight on the feed. That's my take on it. They said their success rate when they use pouting rises to 90% from a blow. So, way better than chicken. Okay, three species of fly make up the fishing maggot. The largest comes from the blue bottle, which you hear buzzing around like a, a spitfire firing on three cylinders. The pinkies come from the green bottle, that's a smaller fly. And the very small ones that Grant was showing us called squats, make the tiny ones, come from the common house fly. They take about 40 gallons are taken from the pits each week to run to casters, because casters Generally, um, match fishermen will tell you, but also general course fishermen in the low will tell you, casters tend to get slightly better stamp of fish. And I think it's because as the fish takes them, the maggot they might have to chew, but the brown, light brown casing of the caster, if you smash them and pop them in your fingers, it's just gunk, it's goo, it's like an embryo if you like, isn't it? They pop it, that juice sends some crackers. They said, in summer, it can take sometimes two weeks for the casters to hatch into a fly. But, here is the thing. Grant knows about it, we didn't talk about it then, but I did know about it. Casters also have their own enemy. Yes, other than anglers. <laughs> in the shape of the tiny Horace fly. It lays its egg inside so that when the maggots are there, their own eggs hatch out inside the maggot or caster, eat their way through the inside of the caster, so when the angler goes to hook it on, the caster goes, Pop! there's absolutely nothing in there, it's an empty shell. So, never get a horse fly in amongst your casters. They're tiny, I've got pictures of them, I'm showing them to you. So there you go, that's a little bit of factual information from when I went out to a maggot farm the smell was horrific, guys, I cannot tell you. Oh. So, I went into one of the, I'm going to call it the maggot room. Well, if you've seen the worst horror films, you ain't seen nothing yet. When you go in there, are thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, of blue bottles, flies, absolutely everywhere, okay? They put sugar up on the shelf to help the flies and keep them up there to give them a bit of feed. They have to put water in there because the flies, I think they got through in one room, two gallons of water a day or something, just drinking the water. Because you've got to keep the flies obviously confined in there. They lay their eggs on the, on the dead pouting and obviously you've got to let that cycle proceed. But those flies, millions of them, I've suddenly thought of the word millions of them, are in there. They're creating their own body heat. So when I went in my stills camera lens, it just completely steamed up. And I said to him, well, hang on, can we not clear this little light? There's a little square in the back where the window's painted, say, black. Can we not clear that out? He said, oh, no, 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 no. The main thing to do if you go into this oh, horror room is move very, very slowly. Flies are everywhere. I cannot, every ear, nose, camera lens, they're everywhere. Do not move fast, he said, because they'll come for you. And he said, if we open the door wide or we have too much light, millions and millions of flies will be all over you because they're coming for the light. So there you go, it's interesting. Also, they, they just fork all these carcasses of dead baby chickens. Maybe they use something different now, I don't know. They come from batteries, they're battery dead chickens. I guess they don't make it. 
um, and then they're fed into the farm system for the maggots to eat. The maggots have to eat those and have great big, great big, huge, as big as half the size of this room of about 18 inches, two feet deep, full of maggots and carcasses. It's a sight to behold. I probably couldn't even film with a video in there because you know, I don't think I could do it again. I've done it the once, so I've actually been inside and done the whole sequence. It's in the book. We're not selling it. If you get a chance to pick one up, you read about it. So, guys, thanks for watching this section of it. Thanks to Grant for giving us a little bit more information. I'm sure we'll find some other bait rigs for him to uh, come up with and give you beginners a bit of information and a sort of background of what else goes on the fishing in the fishing tackle shop. However, don't go away. I'm still on the subject of bait, carp, Boilies, yeah, you're going to watch now, aren't you? Well, people, welcome to the Tackle Shack, where I thought, for the beginners, maybe it's worth, and I have been asked about, the PVA bags or the PVA mesh. And I don't, I rarely use the actual bag, I just use the mesh, because I catch fish on, on the mesh. And basically it's a way of putting, for beginners, advanced people, hang on, hang on, advanced people, experts, all the experts, hang on. There's the doors open. This is for beginners. It's all we're interested in. Having lots of fishing, trying to help people get a few more fish on the end of their line. So, it's highly successful. You use a boilie on the hook. You put samples of your hook bait, i.e. boilies, and or small pellets into either a PVA bag or the PVA mesh. You cast it out. It dissolves in the water, thereby leaving a load of bait right where your hook is. But I thought, my pond is about, just about on the verge of going green with the heat and the drought we've had. So I thought it's ideal if I make up two rigs, well I don't make them up, I just cut them off because I just come in from a carp fishing a couple of days ago, I haven't sorted my tackle box out yet. Rig them up, show you how the two different ways work, put them in the water, You'll see them dissolve because obviously I would guess the bag is going to take longer to dissolve than the mesh. Hey ho, I'm no expert, I may be wrong. Also guys have asked me, well, can we use those bags in salt water? Now as I understand it, yes, PVA dis devolves, dissolves, watch too many politics. It dissolves in salt water, but I, I think, as I understand it, it takes longer. Somebody tell us. So I'm going to make a couple up and show you basically how the rig works. Let's bring the camera over here. I've purposely turned the packets around so there's no blatant sponsorship plugs. So, as I say in the cooking programs, here's one I prepared earlier. I'll put it on like 25 pound mono so that you can see when it's underwater um, what it looks like. So. There's loads of films up there so we can look up these rigs, but basically, look, what it is for beginners, it's called a bolt rig. The bait is attached on what's called a hair rig. So if you can see that, it's, it's swinging loose. You buy these boilies, which are very, well, nibble-free for small fish. So it's, just, so it's basically so you can get almost a night's sleep and only get woken up by a big fish. That's really, I guess, what they're designed for. Um, so... The hook is here, there's a little link there. You can buy these in tackle shops all made up and you get a needle, you put a needle through the, this boilie and then the loop at the end you slot through just there, you see with a little yellow stop there. Some people want to be eco-friendly and use bits of grass, bits of twig, it doesn't really matter as long as it's small. So, this is a safety rig, look, it just pops out, the lead pops off and the swivel just nips in there in a little sort of rubber sleevey bit. Here's my real line. I've cast out, plop, falls on the bottom. Now you can throw all your bait out there, can't you? But it might not be in the vicinity of where your hook bait is. So what you do, that's another one, it's just got a slightly longer link to it, hook link. All shop bought ones, you know, these are just, get them out of shop, whatever size you want, hook size. I don't know, fours, twos, that sort of size, maybe a six, eight, you know, whatever, whatever size bait you're using. So you get different size bags. These ones here, carefully shielding the name. Haven't done me any favours. This is a PVA bag there. It looks just like a little plastic bag. It's a sort of match, matte finish. And now, these you can obviously see, you fill up with bait. You put your hook inside. 
The other method, and this is a mesh one, like a mesh stocking there, you have a tube which you put your bait down in there and you extend it and you probably see me using these stockings with four, five or six uh, boilies in there. But you must keep both the bag and the mesh bone dry, hence the tube here. Look. So it goes in the tube and this is a really good seal, it does seal up there pretty well, keep them dry. These are worth keeping as spares anyway, when you, when you don't, you know, if you get two or three, keep those because they're dead handy. Make some boilies up ready for that night fishing session, you can get one, two, three, probably get four, five or six rigs up in there. You probably even, you might not get the bag in there, you might have to have a plastic container for that. As I understand it, the bag is used to put your weight inside together with your bait for longer casting and also if it's on a weedy water to sink down and pull down through the weed to, you know, to get it down to where you, you think the fish are. The mesh having the hook on the outside, I'll show you in a minute, oh, I just use the mesh all the time myself because I don't cast very far, <clears throat> cast it out, but if it's going through weedy water the hook here is dragging down like this and could snag on the weed fine, that's okay, maybe a fish will take it, your problem being the bag will dissolve below it, not the bag, sorry, apologies, the mesh will dissolve below it, all your bait tumbles down through the water, so the carp are down here feeding, and you're left snagged up on the top here, not so good is it? So I would suggest using this for clear water, uh, possibly you might want to use variants of, this is just a regular hard boiling, a pop-up, so it pops up, off the bottom, if you're in very silty water, you might want a longer link like that. If it's hard gravel, you can use a shorter link. I'm going to show you how I do it. So, I don't like, I don't like putting these boilies in my pond without a chance to catch anything. I'm only going to put five in. I do like the smell of these, whatever that secret make is. You go one. Now you can get rods to push them down. I, I like a larger stocking than this. Did I just say that? Delete that comment. <laughs> I like a larger mesh mesh stocking. Just as bad, man. Um, so that I can put two side by side. This one's a bit tight. But we'll put those in. I think we only need four for this one. Instructional. I'm just telling you, this is just how I do it. You can, you can put other stuff in that obviously you've tied a knot in the bottom, turn it over, you tie another knot in the top, pulling the knot down as tight as you can like that. Then, having procured the scissors, snip above the knot. Voila. That's ready to go. Always, I've made this mistake many times, I'm sure you have, make sure you tie a knot in the end before you put the stocking back on the tube. Otherwise, you're going to put a load of boilies in there and they'll fall all over the floor in the dark. So I like to push this back on top so it keeps it stretched. It then goes straight, straight into the sealed up tube. That there is ready for putting on the hook. So you, the easy way to do it is straight through the knot. As I was told, just go underneath the knot and do a couple of necks. Bearing in mind the hook's barbless, you don't want it flying off. So just go through the mesh, mesh say twice. So there's my rig, if you can see it like that. And that's going to sink through the water, the lead's going to take it down, and we'll see underwater right, how this dissolves in relation to the bag. So you can see what I mean about the hook sinking through weedy waters, the hook is probably going to snag on a weed. These boilies are going to dissolve, or the bag is going to dissolve, the boilies are all going to fall to the bottom, drawing the fish away from your hook bait, which you do not want, do you? So that one there is ready to go. Uh, the bag in contrast, some people put small pellets in here, a lie. I've used a small bag. These are two mil pellets. They put this in, God I knew I'd drop them everywhere. If I can get some in. <laughs> oh this is going to be fun. Then they put, say, that, I know I'm using a long one, I would generally use a short one. They put their hook bait in the bag, coil it all up, Drop it in there, okay, so the weight is near the bottom. Just tap it like this, just to get the weight in amongst it. You want it nice and looped there. And then, pop in, let's say, your, a few of your hook bait samples. One, no. 
One, two, three, very good counting. Five, she picks up on that. Okay, now I'm gonna to have to do this quickly. What you do is you twist, lick this, or get your fingers in a little bit, or twist it, because that will start to dissolve it, and it will start to stick. Tap it all down tight, bed it, bed it, bed it in like that. It's for distance casting. And some people also damp or spit on these corners and just push them in and make it a nice pack package there for casting out. I'm gonna do that down by the pond, because as soon as I've done the lick and stick business, I want to be able to put it in the water. So let's get down and see if we can't get these underwater and just see how quickly they do dissolve. So I'm just going to lick and twist this tight and put them both into the water at the same time. So bear with me. Just twist it up like that. A couple of dabs on the corners. And you can see that's melted and dissolved. Let's get them straight in the water. Well, it's warm enough to go swimming in there, but you can see how fast that burst apart, especially the mesh. But I'm going to take those two rigs out of there now because I want to see what the breakdown is on those boilies. You got the principle of how it works, you can see how it works. You use mesh, or you can use the bag. What I did find interesting was the way that using the two mil uh, extra pellets, they went over the top and they tumbled down and landed right on the lead. Now, if you're clear water fishing, it doesn't matter at night, what can they see? Who knows? But during the day, they might see that lead on the hard fish water. So maybe adding a few two mils in there in the bag helps it all tumble down. Of course, you can use the same principle on the uh, uh, mesh bag, but the lead is nearly always away from the mesh bag when it lands. So that way, with the actual solid bag, you're going straight down in one big clump it might work in your advantage during daylight. It covers up the lead. That's what I'm just saying. I'm no expert. I just catch them. You know, I go fishing, I catch some carp. I'm going to take those rigs out of the water now and uh, I'm going to try and time that and come back tomorrow and see how they've degraded in the water. Bear in mind, there's no fish in here. There might be some creatures that come in, I don't know. But I thought it gives you an idea how that bolt rig works and it's highly highly successful for carp dead easy for beginners how easy is that the fish hook themselves brilliant And this guy's look, not not one day, two days later, the small two mils are just starting to smoke up. But absolutely, the boilies haven't really degraded whatsoever. Next day I go out, third day, third day, still there, small pellets breaking up a bit, boilies zero. There you can see, a bit later on, they're getting a little bit sort of puffy, flaky around the edges. So how long have they been down there now? Four days or 
That's right. <laughs> I couldn't believe this myself, I have to say. And as you can see, if I get hold of them in my hand and I give them a bit of a, a squeeze and a crunch up, they will actually powder up and break. But I mean, how long do they actually stay on the bottom? Well, there you go, people. There's a bit of information there for you that I found about, you know, the boiling breakdowns in water. I don't know how long they take to break down. I've got no idea at all. It's over two weeks. <laughs> it's a long time, of course. If there were fish in the water, they might nibble away at them. But don't forget, boilers are built for hardness, for not breaking down. They is to keep small fish away from nibbling. But if there were small fish around, I'm sure they'd nibble them up. And of course, the bigger fish scoff them and move on. I was only interested in what the breakdown rate was. You know, how long are they if the fish don't get to them? How long do they stay in the water? It's a bit of interest. Any information, guys? That you got out there, nail it on the comments page. Clean ones, all clean ones, we don't want offensive ones, okay, they don't get too many offensive ones now, they just go bat, remove them lock for the idiots. Anyway, if you get a chance, have a look at that book, scout around, there might be other books out there as well. Um, we'll see you in the next one, hopefully we've got some fishing for you, but I thought the weather's been so dire lately, and the, the UK river season by the time you get this is, so I don't know when I'm gonna put it up, probably round about when it closes, well, that's depressing enough. And the next best thing to actually going fishing is, let's face it, talking about it, maybe reading some old books, or better still, watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. It is the greatest all-round fishing show in the world. See you next time.